We have a, what to me is a very special group of people. Be, this next one is on partnerships, and it will last through the noon hour. We have several speakers. We have <coughs> the beginning a partnership going on between Circle, which I co-direct and is co-directed with, with Anna Hoofnagels there and with Miranda Brady and with Gehende, who couldn't be with us here today, Horn Miller. And uh, Anna will, will do the formal introductions and tell you about a project that we're involved in where we are in partnership with Sarah Rourke, who's from Aquasasne and from the, the Native American Traveling College. And uh, we're trying, we're doing the best in, in our hearts, in our, own, in our way, as we find our way along the way to build a relationship that will be enduring and mutually beneficial and model the good practices that are so important that are being brought up here today. So with that, Anna Hoofnagels. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, I want to thank all of the elders who have been sharing their wisdom with us for the past few mornings. I know um, as, I, as I've been sitting listening to them, it's just been such an enriching um, experience to be able to listen to their words. So thank, thank you, miigwech, to all of the elders and those who are yet to speak to us. Um, it's a real privilege to be here as um, part of the research team um, for this project, but also as a faculty member here at Carleton. I think the Cure Up is, a, is an awesome initiative that's been um, developed here at Carleton, and I'm glad to see so many people participating in it. So thank you for coming here. Um, what we're going to do today for this session, there's three separate kind of parts to this presentation. So it's not a keynote, it's not one person speaking. But what we wanted to do in this part of the, of, of the uh, program for CUREP is to talk about partnerships, developing partnerships, um, how to negotiate with um, communities. Um, sometimes communities reach out to researchers and sometimes researchers reach into communities. So we have two different models of um, um, research partnerships that have been developed at different stages of development. We're talking more at the preliminary stages of, we're in the process of developing research projects. The second presentation is a project that um, has a longer longer history than ours. And then we're gonna follow it up with um, some words from, words of wisdom from the Secretariat. So kind of tri-council stuff. So, so we're gonna, I'm serving multiple roles as facilitator of this session, but also as a researcher as part of this research project. Um, so the Native North American Traveling College, the NAA, N, I, I keep saying that, double NATC, yeah. <laughs> yes, um, and the Center for Indigenous Research, Culture, Language, and Education. So the team members, just to kind of give you a sense of who we are, um, uh, Sarah, let me get my papers out here. Um, Gunwa Hahawi Wark. Um, she's the director of the Native North American Traveling College. And um, I'm going to read a bit of her biography because um, I've gotten to know her as just a really wonderful person. But as you learn more about her, you will discover what an amazing person she is um, beyond just a lovely person. Um, she is of the Aguasesne Mohawk Nation and belongs to the Deer Clan. She's the wife at, of Atonwa. Sorry. Adwa. As a longhouse woman, I'm going to slaughter that. Um, Gunwa Hahawi strives to set a good path for the future generations. She's the manager of the Native North American Traveling College, a cultural center and museum that focuses on cultural revitalization, education, and dispelling stereotypes of First Nations people. She's a strong advocate of research in the areas of culture as prevention and intervention. She continues to explore proactive approaches to filling gaps and creating safe learning environments for Indigenous students while meeting their cultural needs. Gunwa Hahawi is the president of the Junguan Adeo, oh no, the Onakwe board that runs the Junguan Adeo um, heritage site that is a community center for cultural education, planting, and youth activities. She's traveled to the UN Permanent Forum for Indigenous Issues for 2013 and 14 with the Native Youth Sexual Health Network to read statements on sexual health, environmental violence, policing injustice, and good governance. She was also able to provide youth mentorship to the Global Indigenous Youth, youth Caucus. She's a proud mentor to the Indigenous, Indigenous Young Women's Council. Gunwa Hahawi is also an ally and advocate for the G LGBTQ as she proactively provides and promotes safe spaces for our youth and community. She was also one of the lead organizers in assisting to bring the Walking With Our Sisters art installation to Aguasasne in November 2015. Um, and she just graduated with her master's in environmental leadership, it, it, with a master's in educational leadership at St. Lawrence University. So um, congratulations on finishing your, your degree. That is you. awesome. And it's amazing that you managed to do that on top of everything else. Um, the other, <laughs> again, an amazing person. 
and so nice. Um, the, the other <laughs> people on the on the board, on, on this panel on this research team, um, Miranda Brady, who's at my far left, your right. She's an associate res uh, associate professor in communications here at Carleton. Um, she can elaborate on her biography as she might like to or not. Um, I know she's very involved in researching Indigenous activism in the 1960s and 70s. Um, to her, our right is, everybody knows, um, Cleo's John Medicine Horace Kelly. So um, he's also been very involved in this research project. And somebody who could not be here but has also been very instrumental is Gahande Horn Miller. Um, she is Mohawk from the... Um, and she has also been contributing. She is. She prepared a short video for us to share with you for this presentation today because she recognizes the importance of sharing her wisdom and having her voice heard. So first, a little bit about who we are. Um, and I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this background information, but the Center for Indigenous Research, Culture, Language, and Education, it's a mouthful. We tend to call ourselves CIRCLE, which has so many symbolic meanings, but we, it's, it's really just a, a quick way of saying um, it's a group of faculty, researchers, and students, and, and staff who are interested in Indigenous research here at Carleton University. Um, and our mandate really is to try to bridge and promote research for indig on, with Indigenous peoples and also to help Indigenize the Academy here at Carleton. So with a real focus, um, we complement the work of the Center for Aboriginal Culture and Education, which works on student programming. We try to kind of foster a sense of, of research collaboration and partnering with communities. And we've done a lot of initiatives here on campus, especially in the past few years. Um, every year for the past three or four years, we've had a student conference, so giving a, a platform for students to share their research. We've done film screenings. We've done special talks. We had Leanne Simpson here this past year, for example. So really trying to build a sense of indigenous priorities here at Carleton University. Um, and it's, there's the, the four of us, the four co-directors have been very proactive in trying to initiate and, and kind of build that community here on campus. Um, and we were quite fortunate that, what was it, two years ago now, Sarah reached out to um, Carleton University and thought this would be maybe there's some, some research initiatives that we might be able to partner with. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on Circle. We're trying to do a lot of really good work. Um, I think we've been successful, and I think we also have a lot more work to do. And I think these kinds of forums here with, the, with CURIP is a good, good place for us. I'm going to now pass it over to Sarah, who's going to talk about the Native North American Traveling College and her ideas. She reached out to um, Carleton University. She actually contacted Darlene Gilson, who was a research officer. She had some ideas for research, and the marriage was, I don't know, it wasn't an arranged marriage, but Darlene was instrumental. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> well, thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Um, as she said, my name is Sarah Gwahahawi Rourke. I'm the deer, of the Deer Clan. I have the privilege of being the director of the Native North American Traveling College. We were founded in 1969 by Ernest Benedict, who has been an amazing forerunner in cultural education, um, community activism. He was really such an amazing role model for many, many indigenous youth of his time. And he's made, he set precedents in our communities for speaking his truth and his voice. Um, so in 1969, he packed up a van of resources and started traveling around to other indigenous nations, teaching and learning about what it is to be indigenous, what it is to combat those stereotypes and misconceptions and misrepresentations in the media about who we are and to speak that truth. And it ended up turning into a small home on Cornwall Island where many elders gathered and we had a, a replica village. And the heyday of the traveling college was in the 70s where people would come and sit around a wood stove or they would sit in the village and they would learn and sing and, and share in cultural practices and began to remove that shame of what it is to be indigenous and to really um, show that pride. And I'm proud to be walking in the footsteps of all my predecessors when it comes to the traveling college because the work is so important. It is important for us to be real and to persevere against all of the odds that are against us when it comes to working in this in this two world system. So for the traveling college, we do a lot of things in community such as print publications, 
to distribute to cultural education centers and to all education centers from daycare to elder homes. We have a travel troupe that goes into those schools and does those dance presentations and, and really tries to reinstate that knowledge. Uh, we try to have a language component as much as possible. We have um, social song and dance CD release parties. We have exhibits every for, um, for a year, every quarter. Our curriculum and our work plan devel is developed in, co it coincides with the ceremonial seasons and our growing seasons. So it's very um, natural, it's very organic in how we conduct ourselves in community and we try to support all of our community artists. Um, many, many famous artists from Akwazesne have come through the doors of the Traveling College. Many leaders who are now amazing public speakers in our community have been able to be a part of Travel Troop, have been able to sing and dance in that Travel Troop and to speak uh, on our history and our culture. We have a small museum and we also have a very large archive which has gone untouched for quite some time. Our AV techs and our media coordinators are documenting our every move at the college to make sure that we continue to bring this knowledge to all of our future generations. And because of this, we have a, a mission. We have a, an idea, and with Carlton's help, we're going to make this come to fruition. And I'm really excited to see where it goes, because at this point, our research is at a standstill. We have um, many closets filled with VHS and cassettes and reel-to-reel, -reel and, and they're all the voices of our elders. They, we want to reconnect to our elders, especially those who have passed on. And the hurt that happens when our elders leave us is not just the hurt of losing a person, but it's also losing all of that knowledge and that's so deeply ingrained in us. And as we sit and we soak up things like a sponge, when we sit in ceremony or we sit in council or we sit in community, um, not all of, that ling all of that information can be retained. So with the help of Circle, I feel that we are really going to move forward in digitizing and um, making an accessible database for community, but as well for researchers, and be able to draw those very distinct lines of ethical practices and the importance of research in our communities for our um, young students who are coming through who really want to bridge that gap between native and non-native research and, and where can we find and meet that common ground in the middle and where the knowledge comes together and it can be really proactive for all. Because I feel like our educational approaches are very holistic. And for us, it's really a balance of finding out how we can live with, um, with all of that knowledge and actually make it action. I know there's a lot of us doing research where we're trying to revitalize those teachings in any way that we can, whether it's basketry or beadwork or um, wampum making or whatever, quilting. There's so many different things, but every single one of those things has a component to it that's a traditional knowledge, that's a language, that's a historical knowledge, it's political implications, it's emotional, it's spiritual, it's ceremonial. There's, there's there's so many different components of that one act of making a basket that we have to look at all of that and if we can look at it, examine it, and make it accessible for communities so they can carry it on, then that's what we, we need to be doing and that's what we're going to be doing. So I'm really excited to see where it goes and we're just at the beginning stages of this and we have a really great cohesive unit within our committee at this point. And I know Gahanda is gonna talk about um, bringing in community. And the whole reason that we do this is for community. I was raised in a community where we look at the next seven generations. We look at how my road, and my name is Gwahahawi, which means they gave her the road, and, and this is the road that I'm going to travel on that's gonna lead the path for our children and our children's children and so on and so on. So if I can do that in any way that's possible through publications and media and databases or however it is most accessible, because at this point our youth are very LinkedIn. They're very much 
social media kids. They're very much, they need to find something in an instant, it needs to be accessible, or they're not interested. So we need to meet our youth where they're at instead of trying to teach them how to learn like we do. So I think with this database, it's going to be able to open those doors for them to have more accessible learning. Thank you. Um, I'll probably add more later, but that's that's where I'm at at this point, and I'm really excited to see how this partnership is going to grow and and what we can really make of it. Because at this point, there's there's so much to see in our collections, and it's um, 50, 40 years, 40 years of um, collecting data. So to be able to move forward with that, and I I would like to hear my elders speak again, even if it's on a video. Thank you. My name is John Kelly, of course, as you probably know, Cleol is my Haida name. And what Sarah is saying about the archive, well, a funny thing happened on the way to Akwesasne, or while we were there. We got shown a room, and something that's very dear to my heart, because I, I began my career in uh, working with Native communities in British Columbia, recording languages, stories, and songs would make two recordings when I recorded. We installed equipment so that the bands could record their own elders. But the materials I recorded, I keep a copy in our basement that's Darlene back there. <laughs> and, I keep, and the copy stays with the community. And I'm, I'm honor bound by my word that the copy that we keep in our basement will never be used by anybody other than the community. It's not ours, it's theirs. It's turned out to be extremely valuable. One community, the Wet'suwet'en, called me one day a few years ago to say that some 40 CDs worth of material had been deleted by a technician who thought a computer was useless. And it was gone. And she said, John, is there anything we can do? And so I can say, yes, I've got the other copy. So we copied all 40 of those. And Darlene and I actually hand delivered Darlene back there, sitting in the back with the silver hair. She says, quit talking. Stay in your <laughs> We actually hand delivered those to the community. And so that's very, very near and dear to my heart as a member of Circle, as one of the founders of what is today's Circle. When we were at Akasasne, I saw a stack of 16 millimeter films. No projector yet, but the films are there. The voices of the elders that the community needs so badly are there and preserved and ready to be transcribed and put to use, digitized and put to work. And that's something that'll be dear to my heart when that part of the project is underway. And so I count it a privilege to be here. I count it a privilege always to be part of any effort to bring community work together with what has been called academia that is in the process of changing right now in the way that it does things, to work with communities and to begin to the process, to take part in the process of healing our cultures and bringing them back together. So as I say, it's quite an honor to be working with Sarah and with the crew over there. Hawa. Thank you. Um, thank you. I'll keep my um, remarks very brief, but I want to just reiterate that it's quite an honor to be working with this team um, and to be associated with this project. It's, it's quite exciting. Um, and I should say there's a number of different projects that are coming out of this. and so. Um, as we sat down to talk about what the priorities were for the Native North American Traveling College, we also started to trace out um, a research agenda um, as we were going through. So of course, um, we'll work as guided by the Native North American Traveling College and the advisory board that's uh, established through, um, through the Native North American Traveling College on all of the research that we do and all of the what Shirk likes to call the knowledge mobilization that happens. So all of the all of the articles that are published or all of the written materials that come out of it, um, as well as the digital materials that might be used later for the Native North American Traveling College's um, workshops, so their educational materials. Um, we're currently working on a couple of different projects related to the audio video archive that, um, that John was just discussing. Um, one of those projects includes a partnership with, uh, with GRASEC, 
um, that's a knowledge sharing tool. It's the Great Lakes Research Alliance for the Study of Aboriginal Arts and Cultures. I had to read it <laughs> because it's a, quite a long acronym. Um, but this is a knowledge sharing tool that includes um, digitized versions of material, culture, or, or heritage items. And so what we're hoping to do is identify ways to annotate those, the treasures, really, the, um, the items that are digitized in that database. Um, and think about how elders could speak to those items or how other cultural lessons could be also um, included in that knowledge sharing system um, to help um, mobilize those, those heritage items for um, contemporary cultural practices um, to keep those uh, as part of living culture. Um, so that's one of the projects that we're currently working on. So we've gotten some funding for a small pilot project. Um, and so this summer we'll be going through the audio video collection, um, working to digitize it using um, equipment that we've gotten by hook or crook, <laughs> borrowed, <laughs> and borrowed and stolen <laughs> from various quarters, uh, and also identifying um, you know, words or um, lessons that might be, um, might be used for educational materials um, for, for the future. Um, we're also working together on a Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, um, SHRC, Partnership Development Grant, um, to uh, get funding to write a history of the Native North American Traveling College. So it's our hope that um, that, that history could be um, used in ways that are accessible to the community. So published perhaps in a, a book form or other, um, maybe even digital components that could be accessible to remote community members who are not necessarily located in community now. Um, but also it could potentially have um, academic forms as well that would be accessible to, to our colleagues. Um, so Gaiandia will discuss the governance structures that are going to guide this work. One, one, of course, one important component of that is the advisory board I mentioned. Um, and of, as always, we're going to be using a model that um, really privileges the community's perspectives. Um, and of course, we'll be working according to the tri-council policies, um, as well as our, our own ethics board. Um, so as we're approaching knowledge keepers or elders, we will, of course, have to have gotten ethics permission to do that. Um, so we'll, we'll be working with the university for guidance on that as well. Um, and all of our work will be conducted appropriately and in the spirit of respect and reciprocity. Absolutely. Thank you. So what we're going to do now, um, Gohande, as I said, she couldn't be here. But because the, the nature of the research that we're doing is community-based, um, and it's a partnership between two existing organizations, the Native North American Traveling College and Circle as part of Carleton, um, we do want to make sure that the community is on board with the work that we're doing. So we're in the process of applying for research ethics clearance through Carleton University. But in order to move forward in a respectful fashion, um, we, we also want to have a, a, a group or a committee um, or a board within the Aquasesne community who's going to help guide the research that we're doing to make sure that it's okay because they don't have, um, Aquasesne does not have like a governing board for ethics within the community. So Gahandi's gonna speak to um, the, the model that we're be, that's being proposed. If you can press play, that would be great. Gahandi, you're just akskare wake ni'i kanyak gahaga ni wanjotum so that's just a, a short greeting in Kanyagaha. And I wanted to say that I'm Gahande Juan Miller, and I teach in the School of Indigenous and Canadian Studies. And I'm happy to be able to participate in some small way in today's uh, presentation with my colleagues uh, who are part of CIRCLE. So what I'm going to talk about with you today is the idea of a community advisory board. Now with our work that we're going to be doing with Aguazasne, what we've proposed is putting together a small community advisory board. Community advisory boards can be pretty much any size that you want. Uh, the one that I'm accustomed to in Gahnawage as part of the Gunwage Schools Diabetes Prevention Project has been comprised of anywhere from 20 to 22 members um, since 1996. So this has been going on for quite some time since diabetes prevention has been an, um, seen as a research focus for our community. Now, if some of you are interested in learning more about Gunawage Schools Diabetes Prevention Project and its structure, 
you can look it up on, online at ksdpp.org. But here I'm going to talk to you about a small component of that, which is the Community Advisory Board. And perhaps maybe it is the most important component because it is what links our community of Gahnawage uh, very closely and, and places it very directly and centrally within the research process, which I know of, is of interest to you all here. So what it does, what the Community Advisory Board does for Gahnawage is it's, it's made up of ad hoc members, like I said, anywhere from 22 to 22, 20 to 22 members, who come from all different areas of the community. So they are, they meet on a monthly basis and they oversee any projects that are taking place or that are proposed uh, that will take place in the community. And so they provide what, what could be considered cultural, social and community guidance on any of these projects. And so some of the main tasks so far um, have been their participation in the creation of a vision statement um, that, and a code of research ethics which describes how the Community Advisory Board, community researchers and academic researchers could work with one another in a respectful manner. And of course this process of putting together a Community Advisory Board is of course grassroots and so it's representative of various, area, various peoples and organizations throughout the community. So in the past 14 years, there have been over 40 volunteers. And of course, this is a voluntary um, structure. It is a voluntary for anyone to participate in. And they, the members can range, range in age from 26 to 80 years of age. So they facilitate commu communication amongst all the organizations and also amongst families and make that link uh, between the community and the research, uh, the researchers and the researcher itself. So what they do is they also monitor and review projects that are ongoing or ones that have been proposed. They're, they're asked to review them. They also participate in intervention activities. Um, they, they participate in the evaluation process through data collection, um, the research process, the analysis and the interpretation. They also review and approve abstracts, papers, and other presentations and research proposals. So any kind of final presentation that comes out of the research itself, uh, they will review it and also give guidance on how that research is to be disseminated back to the community. And then they also participate in representing the projects at meetings and conferences worldwide. So what we're proposing for Aguazasne is putting together a small community advisory board. I have participated in one for the Roots of Resilience project uh, at Gahnawagi, which is looking at which Dr. Kiermeyer of McGill was looking at um, how resilience is looked at within the community. So there was, um, there was five of us that were on this small community advisory board and um, which was separate from the larger Community Advisory Board of KSDPP. So what we did was we met on a bi-monthly basis and reviewed the project as it was going along, gave input, insight, um, reviewed the abstract, reviewed the final uh, publication as well, and also gave input on how to disseminate that information back to the community. So that was that's the model which we are looking at for Aguzasne's project or the one that we're going to be doing, that Circle will be doing with Aguzasne. So we're, we're proposing to put together just a small community advisory board that will oversee this small, projects that, this small project that we're working on with the community. So that's a little bit of insight into what a community advisory board is and can be. Like I said, if you're interested in learning more, there are some articles out there about Gunawaga's Community Advisory Board and its efficacy. Uh, you can also go onto their website, which is ksdpp.org, for further information. In the meantime, enjoy your, your week. Take care. Ona. I feel like we should clap, but you should hear it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> <Clap>. <laughs> yeah.
Um, so anyway, just in terms of wrapping up our part of the presentation, we are very much in the kind of preliminary stages of developing the partnership, but I think the model that we've taken in terms of moving slowly, consulting, um, both parties consulting with each other, developing research priorities in consultation and in, in agreement with each other, recognizing the needs of the researcher, the needs of the community, and finding ways that we can kind of create something that will suit everybody's interests. Um, that is really what we're working towards. Um, and I think we're trying very much to be guided by best practices. Um, best practices as researchers, but also looking at the best practices of the Native North American Traveling College. I think one of the priorities, one of the larger term um, priorities of our research together is to be able to highlight this um, incredible organization with a long history um, and to be able to celebrate it both within its community but also as a role model to other organizations, other community organizations across Canada that should we be able to document um, the effectiveness of their programming, they might be able to be, serve as a model for, for other organizations looking to do similar kind of work. Um, so in terms of the programming that we're doing, we are starting with the archival project. That is a priority identified by the Native North American Traveling College with the support of GRASAC. We should be able to do that. Um, and I think it's a really great opportunity as researchers for us to be able to roll up our sleeves and see what's in there, see what materials we have to work with. And from that, we can define and, and move forward with um, research, a, a different research agenda or a, an informed research agenda. Um, we also want to look at the programming, the history of the Native North American Traveling College, because you can't just pit more, parcel out one part of something and think you're going to have an understanding of it. You really do need to look at it in um, within its context. So this is a longer term relationship that we're working towards um, building. Um, and everything that we're doing, I think, is based on this idea of, as, as Sarah has, as, you know, kind of identified for us, culture as prevention and intervention. And I think that's something that's very much guiding what we're doing um, and thinking of it in, in, in this tripartite fashion. There's the circle researchers, there's the Native North American Traveling College, and the community advisory board who are going to oversee the work that we do to make sure it's done in an ethical and appropriate fashion. So I think thinking of it as in this kind of triangulation between those intersections is where the research is going to happen. Um, does anybody want to add anything before we take um, any questions that people may have? Yeah, I would say this. Keep watching this channel. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> this program has been 500 years in the making. And something that I said about three days ago is that the work that we are doing and you are doing and all of us are doing is going to affect generations to come. And we're going to work together. And the communities are the ones in charge because the resources are theirs and the culture is theirs. But it's something that is long, long overdue and you have a role to play in it. Every person in this room have a role to play in it. The only word that seems to, one of the few words that matters and matters the most in Haida is Yagu Dung, which translates respect. What we will do, we will do with guidance from the Creator and from all living things, we will do with respect. Hawa. Miigwech. Um, we have a, we started this session a little bit late, so we're a little bit off schedule, but we do have time for if anybody has any questions at this point, comments, you want to be part of the team, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I must say, I feel really honored as a part of the Circle team that, you know, the outreach came from the community, and so to, to, to be able to run with that, it is such a luxury and a privilege, so I, I want to acknowledge that as well, and it's been fun so far. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, my name is Patricia. I just have a clarification question because I do have hearing issues. The website, <laughs> um, she rifled it off quite fast and I don't know where the D, the B, then the P is supposed to go. So <laughs> I know it's KS. I think it's DDP. KS. Oh. KS. KS. Okay, DDP. thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Really good work and uh, I will stay tuned. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> You don't need to make questions up because um, 
<laughs> because um, there will be opportunities. Um, I know John and I will be here f for the rest of the week um, intermittently or maybe the whole time. Um, and I know the others will be around for a while. Um, if questions do come up or if you want to you know, ask something privately, feel free to do so. But maybe in the interest of making sure we have time, lunch in a good time, um, I'm not going to like, prolong this silent space. This isn't a classroom. <laughs> so um, did you want to add something? Yeah, I just wanted to mention that it's really important for us to fill in those gaps and provide that accessibility to community. And there will be two different tracks of research, one that will be accessible only to community that will include ceremonial and traditional knowledge that we won't be able to share to our, our friends and neighbors and researchers. So there will be two sets of accessibility and that boundary will be drawn very distinctly in our policies and procedures. I think it's really important to show that our staff are very young and they are very motivated. You see the young man with the hat, that's Langunis Edwards, and he is our AV technician and he is willing to train and to learn and to spend long hours digitizing this collection. And I am so, um, I'm amazed at where we are now because this has been a dream for the college for a very long time to have this information accessible and I, I can't even um, really fathom how many hours we have to digitize and to put into a database, but we're not doing this in a way where we're not going to be learning from others around us and building on our networks and our foundations that are already existing. And I think that's really important to recognize that there are people who have done work like this and we're gonna learn from their processes and, and really build upon that to see how it wor will work for our individual community because each indigenous community is very specific to their their life ways and their traditions and, and what they are going to allow for researchers to do. And, and so we'll set that standard for Akwazasni and hopefully that it will help others in, in creating what they need for those communities. And I'm really grateful for our partnerships with Grassback and Circle to make this happen. So if, if you ever need to contact us at the Travel and College, we do have a very active Facebook page, um, not so active website, but you can definitely get a hold of us through Facebook. We have people who answer 20 24 hours a day for any kinds of <laughs> questions. When we should be not working, we are. So um, <laughs> definitely contact us should you have any questions or concerns because it is really important to put that call out. Please fill in those gaps. Please let us know what we're missing and give us that perspective that we may not be seeing because we are in it. And as we know in our own research that we often don't, we often miss things because we're so immersed. So if you see something that we don't, please let us know because I think um, our, we are only as strong as our networks and our partners. Yeah, well, thank you. So what I'm going to suggest um, as we switch over speakers, you can start taking off your microphones and exit left stage. You can come on stage. But I think everyone else should stand up <laughs> as this is happening and just stretch your bodies, move around a little bit because, <laughs> yes. And <laughs> so take.